So I'll, I'll start now, even though it's, it's early, because the room's full, and uh, we might as well take off. Uh, I'm, I'm Peter Fisher. I'm the head of the physics department, and this is really, uh, f for me, kind of the, the, the high point of my time here at MIT, at least so far. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I think everybody here has heard LIGO, uh, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory, uh, announced the first observation of gravitational waves on February 11th, and uh, there were some attendant events. And then last Friday, we had a, a great LSC event in 26100 uh, for the public, and, and the, that event was moderated by, by Ray Weiss, our speaker today, uh, and discussed the, the, the project and the meaning of the results. And today, Ray is... Um, going to tell us uh, about the, the physics and MIT communities, uh, about uh, the importance of the LIGO project, uh, its history, and, and what lies ahead. Um, actually, with Ray, you really never know what he's going to say, so I just don't have any clue. Uh, so Ray Weiss was born in Germany, in, uh, in Berlin, in 1932, uh, and the family quickly moved to Prague in the same year. Uh, and then to New York in, in 1938, where he attended school. He arrived at MIT in 1950, uh, procured uh, an, an SB, not without some trials, in 1955, and a PhD from Gerald Zacharias in, um, it's Gerald Zacharias in uh, 1962. Uh, he absquatulated to Princeton for two years and then returned to MIT uh, as an assistant professor in 1964 was promoted to full professor in 1973, and promoted again to emeritus professor in 2001, and now holds the hardest working graduate student chair in the department. Uh, Ray has won many awards. I'm just going to mention probably, uh, well, three, uh, the, the Gruber Prize for his work on, on Kobe, uh, the Einstein Prize of the APS for, for LIGO, and, and probably very significantly the Baker Award for Excellence in Teaching at MIT. And for those of you who don't know, that award is given by the students with, with no faculty uh, prompting. Um, Ray and, and the LIGO program as a whole have really been committed to education as an integral part of the experiment from the beginning. And it's, it's really an incredible story. Uh, on Friday, somebody asked Ray uh, if he was ever daunted by how long LIGO was going to take. And Ray replied, uh, and I, I wrote this down, I tried to get it exact, um, I tried not to think about that too much. I love the tinkering around, the making things work. That's really the best part. That's why I came in each day. But LIGO was sustained over 40 years by people with vision. And Ray was, was certainly one of them. He certainly thought of the long term. And in this, he had some great partners in, in uh, Barry Barish, Kip Thorne, Dave Reitze, Robbie Vogt, and many, many others. And so now I'm going to let Ray tell the story. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> oh. Oh. Wow. Good job. Uh, This is sort of intimidating to have so many people here, but I'm glad you're here because the story is kind of interesting. I'm going to tell you a little about the history, but the history of the field more than the history of LIGO. And uh, I hope I don't get trapped in that too long because uh, there's a lot to tell you about. I'd like to get to the discovery as well. Uh, let me start, though, by saying that we all celebrated Einstein last year uh, when it was 20, 2015 the centennial of the field equations. And there were celebrations all over the world about this. The thing that was not as well known is that in 2016, which is now the centennial we're in now, he also, after having made a geometric theory of gravity, he realized that he also solved another problem, namely that he had, he had a way of making information travel in the gravitational, in the new space that he had invented. And those were gravitational waves. And they were essential. And uh, I want to show you the first paper, a little bit about that. There's some interesting stories associated with that. Um, this is the, uh, the Prussian Academy where the, the, now he's, this is a year later. Oh, boy, this is moving on its own. That's not good. Uh, the, uh, this is a paper on perturbation theory of the field equations, small amplitude excitations. And in this, he tries to look for solutions. 
Oh, boy. There's a worry I have here. This may not, there's something wrong going on here. I may need some help. Why this is so slow. OK. Nah, OK. Anyway, what, is, what, what he was looking for was solutions that were solutions both in space and time. And he found them. I won't go, we're not doing this rigorously. I just want to, I'll show you what this looks like in a minute. But he found solutions to them which satisfied that. And what they are are strains in space. And I'll show you that in a second. Uh, he also discovered a relationship which turned out to be a bit of a problem for him, which is the relationship between these metric components, or these uh, strains, and the amount of energy they carried. And this thing was a problem, and we'll get to that problem as time goes on. It's not a real tensor. And here is what this, these waves look like. And what they are, I want you to imagine and what it is. You're looking at the wave coming at you. The red mark you'll see in the middle is you. And then you'll see a set of dots all around. And what you're looking at are time-varying strain patterns that are uniform in space. And that's the way you want to imagine the ability to detect this. You'll see, there's the red spot. And if you'll notice here, it's a compression in one dimension and an expansion in the other. That was a little s slow, but I mean a little fast. And there are two polarizations of the waves. They come in ones where you are organizing that picture at, let's say, uh, at 90 degrees and 0 degrees, and then at 45 and 135 degrees. And that's because of the spin-2 field, the way we now understand it. The interesting thing in this paper is he makes, a he makes a fairly colossal mistake right here. And this is this 1916 paper. And this relates the sources of the field. And the sources of the field, in this case, are time-varying moments of inertia of mass distributions. So again, the sources of the field are going to be accelerating masses, but of a very special kind in their geometry. But here, this relates the, uh, the, the moment of inertia to, to derivatives, the third derivatives, to the amount of energy being carried away. And you notice they're all positive, all of these things, all different moments of inertia. X, Y, 2, 3, well, 1 is the wave direction, 2 and 3 are the, the directions of the, of the inside the source. And this tells you that you would get radiation from a spherically symmetric thing that is contracting and expanding uniformly, which is wrong. And, uh, and it turns out, uh, well, it's, it's wrong enough so that uh, what happens, he has to correct this in 1918. And he says something very cute. He says, uh, I, in, in an earlier, in, in an earlier uh, presentation of this, I wasn't sufficiently transparent. And on top of that, I made a, a, re a regrettable Rechenfehler, which is a, a, mis a arithmetic mistake. Well, he had made a mistake in physics. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> the, uh, and, uh, and here, then, is the, the correct formula of, again, the, the derivatives of the moments of inertia. The, but now you notice there's a difference in sign here. You can, you can only get things if they have an quadrupolar or an oblate to oblate kind of transition. And so he gets things right, and he has a forgivable, a forgivable factor of two error in this thing. <laughs> OK. OK, now here's the most interesting thing of all the papers that were, this is, I'm going back to the 1916 paper. And he says, in, he picks out one of those terms that relates the time variation of the quadrupole moment, or the, of the moment of inertia, to the energy carried. And he notices that he says something here, which is really most amazing. And here's the translation. He says, if you think of this and just look at this terrible factor that's in there, 10 to minus 27, and a horrible factor of 1 over c to the fourth, which you have to multiply all this by, you find that this is never going to have any practical application in physics or anywhere. And you come to think, how did he come to that? And I've asked the people in the uh, people who do uh, the history of science, especially now at Caltech and also in Jerusalem, about this. And they haven't found what I'm looking for, and I'll get to what, what this slide says in a minute. I've been looking for exactly the back of the envelope calculation that led him to this. And here is the, and I hear you, I'll walk you through a little bit of the back of the envelope calculation here by you following. This is the, the same relationship we talked about a few minutes ago, but this time I'll dwell on it a little more, which is the, this is the, the pointing theorem, effectively, for gravitational waves. But it's, again, this not really good tensor. It's not a tensor that's the same gives you the same answer in all coordinate systems. And so what happens is you get the amount of intensity carried by the wave is the, the time derivative of, this, of the square of the, it's the square of the time derivative of the strain and both these two polarizations. That's the big thing. And this factor, which you can't neglect, is, tells you something really horrible. It tells you the, a tiny amount of strain 
and here's this 10 to the 36, gets you an enormous amount of energy. In other words, space is extremely stiff. You can't push space around. And that is the reason that you don't get much gravitational radiation. It's also the reason behind why it's taken so long to make a measurement of it. And then, if you want to estimate for yourself, here is uh, the quadrupole formula rewritten in modern garb. It has the Newtonian constant, the mass squared of a system that is going to radiate. And it goes as the sixth power of the frequency with a c to the fifth. By the way, this is very similar to what happens with quadrupole radiation in ENM, except the angular distribution pattern is entirely different. And if you want to estimate for yourself, and I'm sure Einstein did this, when you combine that with the pointing theorem, you can write a very beautiful and simple little uh, thing to, to, to estimate amplitudes of h. And what it is, is effectively, well, the Newtonian potential divided by c squared, or gm over r. In other words, m is the system, g is the Newtonian constant, g is the distance you're away from that system, divided by c squared. That is a, a dimensionless constant of the theory. And v squared over c squared is the amount of not spherical expansion, both the velocity, but rather sort of a, 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 a thing which measures a little bit amount, a little difference between this kind of motion and that kind of motion. But for some of the things which I'm about to tell you, they're the same. And so for Einstein, must have applied this immediately. And for example, if you apply this to what he probably, one of his favorite things was trains. I can only imagine when we find this, we'll find out that he calculated the gravitational radiation that comes from two trains hitting each other and making a, going from a, from a quadrupole, that's a linear quadrupole, into a spherical distribution. Suppose that happens. And if you calculate the train having a velocity of 100 kilometers per hour, and you say the train cars are each 10 to the 5 kilograms, okay, and uh, that's all you need, and you now say, okay, what is the kind of radiation you get out of that? You find out H in the periods of the order of a second, because a train car is probably 30 meters long, and you let that all squish together and it takes about a, a little under a second, you will get 10 to the minus 44 for that number. For H, 10 to the minus 44. That's hopeless, absolutely hopeless to measure. And Einstein must have then gone on, and I'm assuming this, that he went and looked in astrophysical systems. And in his day, there were, uh, you know, people found binary stars. And binary stars in those days had one solar mass. They still do, but they were very slow, the ones that they knew about. And so you wind up with, for example, from a, these are the parameters, solar mass, two stars, solar mass with a one-day period at a distance of about the center of the galaxy, although it wasn't known at that time that we had a galaxy. But let's say that's what, where, it is, where it would be. You wind up with an h value of about 10 to minus 23 with a half-day period. And when you convert that to what you might be able to see through a telescope, you ask, What's the change in aspect of that binary system? How much does it change? It takes you something like 10 to the 13 years before you can see that the orbit has changed a little bit. So that's also hopeless. And so Einstein had this terrible thing. He said that's why he made that statement. And I'd love to have proof of that. I mean, I made all this stuff up that I just told you. OK. <laughs> yeah. okay. And, uh, OK, so these pictures, some of you have seen who've been to a faculty meeting. I never got through them. I'm not going to go everywhere. But this is the 100 years between then and now. And I want to pick out some highlights. And as I tell you the highlights of the history, I also bring in some of the science that is necessary to understand the highlights as they apply today. So here's Einstein and, uh, with, uh, with, with the general theory. And uh, there it was later interpreted, especially what we're talking about, by Max Abraham. He, and the guy who was the first real analyst of this Einstein theory, especially for the gravitational waves, was Eddington. And Eddington found all sorts of troubles with the theory. He found that a binary star that when he calculated would accelerate due to the gravitational radiation. It would make somehow energy from nowhere. So that he became very skeptical, and he got very upset about the pseudo tensor, that thing that I kept pointing to. And by the way, so you understand what this is all, these color codings are for theory, is blue. For observation, it's green, and for technology, which is very important as a change in this last 100 years, so you had a chance to do something with this, you can see various things. For example, uh, here is uh, the vacuum triode, and here's the lock and amplifier, and it's about 36. And these are all important things. And the idea that you had servo systems, that's going to be very important for what follows. So along comes uh, the next big thing is right about here. Right after the formulation of the theory of the field equations, uh, Carl Schwarzschild gets the solution of a spherically symmetric solution to the Einstein field equations. And he finds something very peculiar. 
at when the radius of a system is equal to gm over, R, gm over c squared. That's the Schwarzschild radius. At that point, when you, you look at the in spherical coordinates, you find out that time goes to infinite. You can't, uh, uh, proper clocks are still working, but they take infinite amounts of coordinate time to be seen. And on top of that, things just, uh, space has curled up on itself. And Einstein didn't believe it. Nobody believed it. And I'll give you some numbers for that. That Schwarzschild radius for the Earth is about half a centimeter. If you took all the mass of the Earth and stuck it into, uh, into a half a centimeter, you would begin to see these strange effects of the time varying and the space curling up on itself. Or for the sun, it's about a, one, it's about a kilometer. So those are scaling numbers for where things begin to go crazy. And uh, it was not believed. And uh, the first person that, uh, that I knew about that did anything about this was actually J, uh, Robert Oppenheimer. And they studied, what, they studied what happens when a star finally gets to the point where it's so heavy or it's so cold in the star that it begins to collapse. And it collapses, and it, it does nothing to stop it, especially over a certain mass. And it began to, people began to realize maybe that has something to do with that Schwarzschild solution. And uh, so th th this was work he did with Snyder. And uh, by the way, just about the same time, uh, Rosen and Einstein began to doubt the idea of gravitational waves again, all over. Not only from Eddington, but they had their own idea. Namely that, my god, they want to see if there was an exact solution to the field equations. And they came up with something, they published it, it was wrong, but they still believed that it was right. And that's a long story in its own right. But Einstein himself wavered over his life, where the gravitational waves, aside from their inability to be detected, whether they were real. Real in the physical sense. And uh, so the next big event in this thing, and here, is, this is now from, 19, from 1916 to about 1960. In this whole epoch, there wasn't a hell of a lot being done in this thing. There were people discovering things in astronomy, people de developing technology, but relativity was pretty static. And in fact, that's the time when relativity became relegated to mathematics departments, pretty much. When I came to MIT, there was no relativity course for, for physicists at all in 1950. And so here is the... Point. This is a, this is a important point that happened. At, in 1957, there was something called the Chapel Hill Conference. And what was discussed by especially Bondi and Perani was, what's the reality of the waves? And they came up with sort of a Gadakan experiment of their own. They, they took a bar and they said, look, you put beads on that bar and put that in a gravitational field that has got a gravitational wave. Those beads are going to move on the bar. And consequently, the bar is going to get hot because there's friction between the beads and the bar. OK, that's sort of typical theorist experiment. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the, uh, it's, I mean, it's nice to think, and you'll see there'll be more of those. But, the, uh, uh, but uh, it, that, that's triggered in Wheeler and in Joe Weber the idea that maybe you should go look for these gravitational waves. That was new. And Joe Weber built a system and a great big bars. He was at the University of Maryland, great, great big bars that uh, would, the idea was that a gravitational wave would come along, excite the bar to ring, it would go through, and it would then sing on after, and you would hear the ringing. And to him, that was a very good way to look for gravitational waves. And it is a good way to look for it, but he then got himself into trouble because he saw gravitational waves. That was the trouble. Yeah. Okay. And uh, in fact, he started publishing there were gravitational waves, and he had coincidence experiments between different bars all over, in different parts of the country. And other people then began to do those experiments themselves. They did not see what Weber did. So Weber was a, a remarkably imaginative scientist, but he got himself in trouble by being, I think, a somewhat sloppy experimenter. Now, people will hate me for having said that, but that's what happened. And, uh, and the next idea that comes along in this thing is really an idea that none of us knew about in the United States, but the interaction of a light beam with a like, gravitational wave was done in Russia by a guy named Gerstenstein, who gave himself the problem of what happens if you send a light beam through a gravitational wave? What happens? And he discovered that you get sidebands. You get sidebands of the, of, the, uh, of the optical wave or the light wave light wave that are at plus and minus the frequencies of the gravitational wave. That was a very important thing, but none of us knew about it. And so the next thing here, at least, was that people like Bob Dickey, who was an experimenter, who really was really involved in the renaissance of, of relativity as an experimental science, began to do experiments. And then I think there was this thing, which I'm going to dwell on a little more now, back in about 1972 or 70, yeah, the idea 
that you could do this, this whole business of detecting gravitational waves as not this way, not by looking at tidal force in the bar, but rather by looking at something much simpler, much easier to understand. And that was something that occurred to me, but to others as well. And, uh, and what it is, is here's the problem I gave in a course to, in, 1907, in 1968 or something like that. I gave this problem to the kids in the course because I didn't understand Weber's experiment. And I said, let's just set up, and I'll, show you, I'll set up the problem very quickly. You know, I won't make a huge fuss about it, but I, I'll say, look, here is, the, here is the Minkowski metric. That's what the metric of, of flat space. Here is a little metric that's due to the gravitational wave. The gravitational wave in this particular representation is moving in the one direction, and it makes its dirty work in the two and three direction. In other words, it's always transverse, moving at the velocity of light. And here are these two polarizations. And here is the thing that I gave as the problem. Using that as the basis, I wanted the students to actually do this Gedanken experiment. Again, another, this time it's an experiment giving a Gedanken experiment. It's not any better, OK? And uh, what the Gedanken experiment was this. Take a mass and another mass, let them be free floating in space, following the geodesics, and each one has a clock, a proper clock. And you notice that the gravitational wave do, in this particular representation doesn't change the rate at which the clock is running. This is a, called the, the traceless, traceless gauge. And, but then you do perform a calculation which is very straightforward. You look at the time when you, at the event of releasing the light, and then you say, when is it received at this point? And in this particular representation, the masses don't move. The gravitational wave doesn't, there's no forces. It's none of that. It's all just in the space itself. And so you say, what must be the interval between the sending and the receipt of the light wave? And that's this thing here. The light, that's always for a light ray, it's that. Here are the coordinates, the time coordinates kept on the clocks. And here you write down what, what is the metric. And the metric has this term, which is the Minkowski metric, and this metric, which is the part that is the time varying part. And then you, so you don't want to do an integral. That's much too hard for us. But you assume that it takes only a very short time for the light to travel compared to the period of the wave. And you make the unfortunate but realistic assumption that h is very small compared to 1. And lo and behold, you can solve this set of equations, and you find out there's an inferred distance. Here is the separation of those two masses. And that it looks like the inferred distance, as by timing the light, is changing. This is not changing. The position of the masses doesn't change. But here is a time-varying term. And you do a little more manipulation with it, and you find out, yes, that you can, with timing light, measure the strain in the wave. And that happens to be the difference in length that you have inferred from the timing divided by their separation is equal to h, that same variable divided by 2. And that I gave as a problem. Every kid in the class was able to do it. Sort of interesting. So that's the beginning of the idea. And uh, what then happened is that the idea got converted into a more or less realistic experiment. And that was done at MIT, but it was uh, very shortly in other places as well. But here was the thing that was done. And here are some people who did it. One of them is here, uh, David Shoemaker. I don't know where he is, but he's, I know he's here. And here are some graduate students with his, uh, his compatriots. And they built this thing. And here's what they built. Uh, they built the thing which was, uh, here is a great big central mass. Here's a laser. The laser sends light in. Here's some modulators. That's just a way, a trick to be able to vary the light quickly so you can measure it. And here is a reentrant device that lets the, the beam bounce back and forth a lot of times. And then you have the same thing from the other side. The beam bounces back and forth. It gets recombined, and it goes to a photodetector. And the photodetector then, uh, uh, the photodetector is, is used in, in a way to do the following. You have arranged this all so there's no light at the photodetector. At the, when there is no gravitational wave. But when there is a gravitational wave, you've changed in these path lengths, or the times it takes light to go into two paths. One has been increased, one has been decreased. And, uh, and then what, what, what comes of it is you use that in a trick that Bob Dickey showed us. Namely, you use that to hold the interferometer at a fixed point. You make a servo system out of it, and then you read the servo system out. That was the basic idea. And that was built, and it sort of worked. Now. That whole idea then migrated to a very, very good group in Europe, uh, a group that had been making bars. They had come to the point where they were showing that they couldn't get anything from, Weber, from Weber's, Weber's experiments didn't seem to pan out. And they had a decision to make. Should they try this, this thing, or should they make a better bar? And they decided to try this interferometric idea. And uh, so here are some people where they made huge advances in this thing. This simple idea got enormously better by uh, all these people who added their own special ideas to this. 
and I won't go into all of the ideas, but, uh, but, but hanging all the masses, not just the mirrors, but hanging everything was a very important change. Feeding the light back from the laser, making the laser a, uh, made, coupling the laser to the, to the interferometer in such a way there's no reflected light at all from the interferometer was an idea here. Worrying about scattered light. Uh, worrying about the, getting rid of these modulators. That was Lisa Schnupp's big idea. Then what happened, while they got a, a system working, and beautifully working, uh, they, there's a group in Glasgow, this is Ron Breaver, and his, and his associates at the time, they went to Germany, saw what was going on, and they came up with an, uh, separate ideas of doing it, and they were also excellent ideas. And for example, one of the ideas you'll see implemented in advanced LIGO, uh, both two ideas, uh, the idea of, we'll talk about that more when we get there, this is called Signal recycling was invented by Mears, and then a, a, a lot of ideas came from Drever, including the, 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 these two men actually did what's called power recycling. They invented it independently of each other. So this began to, began to grow as an idea. And here is a concept that was the initial interferometer we built for LIGO. And I, I'll just simply show you what the different pieces are, and we'll then get to the more complex things as we go along. Here's a laser. Let's not worry about that mirror for a second. Here's a beam splitter. And now we have, instead of these delay lines, we have Bobby Pro cavities. The light bounces back 100 times, bounces back 100 times. Here's the photo detector. You again arrange it so that times are equal in these two arms, so there's no light there. And when there's no light there, all the light, because you have to conserve energy, goes back to the laser. And this was this idea of putting a power recycling mirror in that Schilling and, and Reaver had. And then that makes it so that matches the laser to this whole system. What, what it does is there's no reflected light at all from this mirror. It, all the light that's emitted by the laser goes into heating all these mirrors up. That's, and that means that instead of having a, uh, the amount of light in the system that's appropriate to, let's say, 10 watts from the laser, you have something which has maybe a kilowatt or maybe even tens of kilowatts in the arms because you, the light is all bouncing back in, in, in this resonant way. And here is, for example, the noise budget. And I, this I want to dwell on a little bit is um, what are the things that got in the way? What gets in the way? And now I have to tell you the sort of magnitudes of things that might be gravitational waves. At the time, we were already in full knowledge that if you want to do this, we knew that supernova, for example, was a source. That was, and out of a study that was done later, we have began to look at compact binary sources, like binary neutron stars and binary black holes. But we already knew that if you want to get into this business, you had to measure strains of 10 to the minus 21. There was no way out of that. And so you had to do all sorts of tricks to be able to do that. And uh, so the, and the, uh, the thing is here, for example, is a noise budget of that first detector. This is frequency. This is not the little detector. This is the first LIGO detector that was made, so that you can see the scaling is for a four kilometer system, but based on the equations that were used to look at those prototypes. That's the, that was the proof of concept. And so here is the strain, but not as h, but rather as a spectral density of h, h per unit square root of bandwidth. So for example, here are some noise terms that one had to recon recon reconcile. They're still there, but they're newer ones in the newer instruments. You have to worry about, at high frequencies, you have to worry about the fact you're dealing with a finite number of photons. How much, how well can you split the fringe? You have to split the fringe by 10 to the 11 parts, 10 to the 12 parts, to get down to position accuracies that are sufficient to get you that 10 to the minus 21 strain. So that's, uh, and the more, more power you have, the more, the more better you can measure the phase of the light at the, the detector, the slower this becomes. But that you pay a price for. And you pay a price for, here in, in this detector, that wasn't yet a bad price, but I want to point it out to you, it becomes a price later. And that is, as you increase the power, you also have another term that comes from the radiation itself. And that is, the photons that hit the mirrors are, there's a random term in them which causes the mirrors to be pushed around, very much like the Heisenberg microscope argument. And so consequently, as you increase the power, this gets worse. So there's a minimum point for this particular detector. But there are other things that bother you. For example, here is the noise. You try to run one of these things on the ground in the Earth. The Earth is wiggling by a micron. And it has a spectrum. And the noise comes from anthropogenic things. It comes from every conceivable winds. It comes from uh, you know, earthquakes. But and mostly just people. And so consequently, you make a vibration isolation system. And uh, here's the, the, the estimate for that first one. We'll see how that gets improved in a minute. And then there are things which are there, which are just because we happen to run the system at room temperature. For example, these mirrors themselves are hanging. They're suspended. And they are oscillators. And each oscillator has a KT worth of, 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 of partition energy in it. That is a random motion. 
And by the way, something which we learn, and all of us who work on this thing, we really take seriously a, a theorem which we never paid attention to when we were in school. It's called the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which is a thing that says if you, have a, if you can find out what dissipates energy in a system, you will also find that same mechanism is what causes the system to fluctuate thermally. And it's easy to understand that if you are talking about um, particles, for example. You know, suppose you, have, you don't have a perfect vacuum. And you, hey, well, here's a mirror, and you have particles hitting it from both sides. The damping of the mirror, for example, because of it's on the pendulum, is due to the particles hitting it and the extra velocity or momentum transfer to the gas. That's the dissipation part. The fluctuation part comes from the fact that these are hitting both sides, and they're not equal numbers hitting both sides. So the mirror gets jostled around, just like a, like a cell in a, in, a micro, in a microscope. So that's a beautiful example of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. It's not the one that's bothering us because you have very good vacuum systems. But anyway, so that's a key problem. You can improve that. As you'll see, we may have to cool things eventually. And then you have to get rid of the gas in the system. You can't leave the gas because that forward scatters, and the number of atoms in the gas column are always changing. It's also kind of thermal noise. And finally, there's a noise which actually is still very important, and you'll see this in the final one where we're not talking about the advanced LIGO, but here it's easier to see, is a thing which has got to do with, even though you've done a very good job of isolating the ground noise, let's say with whatever suspension systems you have, you still have to deal with the fact that there are, there are seismic waves running in the ground, and there is a compression wave, and that compression wave pulls on the mirror differently depending on where the wave is. In other words, when, when the ground compresses, the just old Cavendish forces, or Newton's forces, pull on that mirror. And that's what that thing that we call gravity gradient is. And that is a reason why you might want to take one of these things and put it in space, where there isn't this problem. And we'll talk about that more at the end also. And uh, well, that's enough. And then straight light and a whole bunch of stuff. Anyway, that's what made it the thing expensive and long. So let me go on now a little bit with, with the history. We're now in the history at the time when uh, the electromagnetic thing has been started, and people all over the world begin to work on it. Then there is a very interesting development. NASA holds a committee meeting, uh, and it, uh, they want to know what can space program do for this field. And what came out of that is LISA, which is a, the same kind of gravitational interferometer in space. And the guy who ran with that, who was on that committee, was Peter Bender. And he's still, thank God, kicking it alive and pushing it. And uh, so then what happened is that. Uh, the, uh, the, we wrote here at MIT, with some help from Caltech people, we wrote a report. After we had done all this work on the prototypes, we wrote a report, as, especially so that it could be a thing we could give graduate students to work on. I mean, we did that anyway. But if you really want to do it, you want to give the graduate students at least some promise that they would, might ultimately measure something. So the idea was, uh, uh, you know, you can do technology development and development. But we, now we do that a lot. But we have at least something to show for it. You can say, look, if we make this development improvement, we then will detect more sources and stuff like that. So uh, that was not the situation early on. And so we wanted to make that the situation. And the way we did that is we asked for an industrial study. How much might it cost? How would you do it? How would you cite? How would you actually make a thing that was of the order of not meters, but five kilometers? Actually, it was 10 kilometers in, those, in the early days, thinking about how to make it big. And that was a study which then, and during that time, and during this committee, it turns out in this epic right here, Caltech and MIT got together. And Caltech and MIT together presented this to the National Science Foundation. And what happened is that the LIGO project got started. Now, there's two other developments in this picture which are important. And that is that uh, all the while, there is, you know, Alan sits here. This is cosmic inflation was discovered. And it turns out a little bit later, on the next, in the next epics, you'll see things that say, look, there might be gravitational radiation from that, too. And we'll talk about that more later. The other idea that started coming was maybe you could do this by pulsar timing. And that came from Detweiler and, and, De De Detweiler and, and, and Don Backer. And so they, especially that became important when you begin to have lots of millisecond pulsars. Well, there was one hang up in the middle of all of this. Here, the NSF got our report. And uh, then there was a very interesting epic with, uh, um, with Dick Garwin, who was the guy who was very important and very useful in getting rid of Star Wars, also getting rid of the, uh, ultrasonic, the supersonic transport in the stratosphere. But he had done something himself which he couldn't forget. He had been one of the people who killed off Weber. He had made himself a little tiny bar. Not the same as Joe Weber had. And there was a huge fights always in 
at meetings of the physical society when these guys would be on the stage together. You didn't do it my way, Weber would say, I, and, and, and Garvin would say, I did it better than you did, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, and so what happened is that he felt that he had managed to get rid of this crazy field, this nutty field. And when he got wind of the fact that we were suddenly pushing for a thing that wasn't going to cost several million a year, but something like 100 million and maybe 40 million a year, he got, went to the NSF and said, look, if you're, he didn't say it quite the way I'm going to now. He was a little more polite. But he, but he said, if you're going to do this, uh, you better have a really good summer study of this with people who are not interested in this thing, who can judge whether it's worth a damn. And that was done by, by, these, by, by, by uh, Royce McDaniel, who was at Cornell, part of the Fermi Lab, and Andy Sessler, who was a Berkeley was head of Berkeley for a while, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And they were absolutely wonderful. What they did is they looked at this thing. We had industrial people come for a whole week, and people all over the world who were in this, and, and they gave us a ring endorsement, saying this is fantastic science. The only trouble, what stinks, is the management. Okay. <laughs> and, it, and they were right. The management was no good. The management was Kip, Ron Drever, and me trying to pull a $100 million or bigger project together. We were not, we were not quite ready for that. And so what happened is, is to get yourself, a, uh, get, get, get yourself a director. And that's what was done. And here is the first director of the project, Robbie Vogt. And here's Ron Drever and Kip, and I, I was part of this. We submitted a proposal, which finally got the thing going. At about the same time, the Europeans and the Italians, uh, the Italians with Giusotto and the French, made a, Virgo, they made a proposal for Virgo, which is now running. And uh, Carsten Donsmann tried to pull together what was part of that German group and tried to build a big system in Europe. And he went in the direction of Lisa, but he also built a very good, what I would call, large but prototype but for large, large baseline antennas. And what happens in this thing is that here are some people who then became directors of this various things. These are very important figures. Here's David again. And here's, the, these are the variant. here's Barry, who actually saved the project from a disaster. I won't go into that. Uh, and uh, here is the next director, and then this is the current director of the project. And here is then, if you want the timeline, here is what we're going to talk about next. This is the discovery. Okay, so that's the history. I, probably a little too much of it, but okay. I think I have, yeah, I have a little more time. So now what, what does the thing look like now, as a whole, the whole project as such? There are two detectors in the United States, one in, in Hanford, Washington, another one in Louisiana, and these were the results of, the, uh, of that proposal, and Barry was there, who Barry really got the thing happening, and uh, those made the detection we're going to talk about. There was another detector, in, uh, the Virgo detector, which is, unfortunately, we have made a strong collaboration with, but unfortunately, it was not on at the time when this discovery you're going to hear about was made. They're still actually making a better detector. And then there's a smaller detector which actually developed much of the technology which went into the advanced detector in Germany. That's the geo detector. These are new things. There's going to be a new, a new detector in Japan, hopefully. So by, they claim by 2018, I don't, buy, I don't buy it, but probably by 2020. And they're trying to do it in the Kamioka mine, the same place where the neutrino experiment is, three kilometers. And the brand new news is that there is now going to be a project in India using one of the detectors that was well, we're using a LIGO, de LIGO detector in India. And that probably will not be on the air until probably 2022, 23. I hope. It's as soon as that. And what's the purpose of all of this? You'll see why that purpose is important. And you'll see it when you see the results of the, uh, the discovery. That allows us, having all of these detectors, allows uh, uh, the whole field to flourish in the sense that you can now use, with only two detectors, like what we have now, you can only get from timing where a source might be in a gross way, sort of get a circle in the sky from the timing, and we'll get to that. If you have more detectors, you have many more circles you can put, and you can then find out better where the sources are, and then you can tie yourself as a, as a discipline to the electromagnetic astronomy, which people know and love and know, understand a lot better than the gravitational one. And that then puts the sources in the context of knowing all the, all the knowledge that we already have of the universe. So that's a very important development, that we will have more than the two detectors in the United States. OK, now this gets a little technical, but that's what this is about. So uh, what, you, what this curve is, is what you saw before was a stick diagram of the theoretical pictures of the noise. Here is a real, some real pictures. And I'll show this picture twice. I want to show you, this is again frequency down here. And this is spectral density of H. 
And here, you can see various things. I'll point them to you. The red one up here, for example, is the, the Virgo detector just before they, they stopped working on it. And here is the LIGO detector, the enhanced LIGO detector, with still the initial detector. And it's right there. It's better, than it's better, but it has worse performance at low frequencies. Here's 100 hertz. OK, that's an important region we now know. And then finally, here is the advanced LIGO detector. And I'll tell you what's in that in a minute. And that is already, and this is a curve that is about the same as the curve that was used as the noise that we had when we made the discovery. And this was the same at both sites, both at Hanford and Livingston. And you can see a, a, a vast improvement in, there's a somewhat of an improvement right around 100 hertz, probably a factor of three compared to the last time we ran. But their big improvement is down here. Look, here this thing was taking off like that. And now we go from here down to that. So the, at lower frequencies, this is vastly better than what we had before. Okay? And I won't go into these other curves until a little bit later. Okay? So now let me talk about uh, what, what was done to make the advanced detector better. And uh, what they were are um, they better suspensions. And then here we have, these are all pendula, and there are now four of them in series. And that, was, that was developed by the people in Glasgow. And then a the thing that was developed at, all over the LIGO project, but a lot of it here, was an active vibration isolation system. And that's a little hard to see what's going on here. Here's that multi-pendulum system. And what's in this thing is a set of seismometers and actuators. And what's done is there are servo systems that tend to do the following. The ground is shaking everything. It's shaking that seismometer. You use the actuator to know the seismometer. So in other words, an active vibration isolation system that is used to actually kill the ground vibration, not by passive methods, but actually by making it go to zero in a servo loop. And that's done in two stages. And that was very, very important to get that development at low frequencies. And here is the interferometer now. It's not the same stick diagram anymore. What's new about it is a couple of things is that there's now an output mode filter. And then there's also, uh, well, there's the electrostatic drives. I didn't talk about that at all. But this is the interferometer. And there is this additional mirror um, down here. This, this is the same as the power recycling mirror is right there. That's the one that was already in the old one. But now there is a signal recycling mirror, that thing that was invented by Brian Mears and, 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 and uh, Drever. And that allows you to tune the spectral response of the interferometer. That's different than adding, making it more of a power laser power go into the system. You can actually change the spectral response of the interferometer by doing that. So that's a pretty tricky device. And what you see here now is the noise budget. And I won't point, I will point out to you what so this is the actual noise budget, not at the moment. Right now, our, the system is a little worse than this by a factor of about three. It's up here. But the, this is what we know will limit the system once we get the design, which will happen eventually in the next few years. Uh, and what is a very serious issue is this red line right there. And what that is, is it's the, we're now seeing thermal noise in the coating on the mirrors. Uh, but whereas before, we were calculating the thermal noise of the suspensions. And we now know that the surface of the mirror itself has sound waves all over it. We knew that. But they are sufficiently large so that they begin to limit the performance of the system. So that's the thing we have to work on. And the other thing is you can see the quantum noise, which is now the thing that is this, the, shot, the shot noise and the momentum noise is getting very close to being, in fact, it, it determines everything here. And it almost determines everything at low frequencies as well. And there's a whole big movement afoot to try to, and this is work that's being done in the lab now with, uh, by Matt and Nurgis and, 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 and Lisa and a whole bunch of people. But actually, they were the, Matt and Nurgis were the ones who led this thing, is to try to get around the quantum noise limit of these instruments. And they, they think they have a way of doing reducing the noise at high frequencies and also reducing it at low frequencies simultaneously, which is a trick. And if you ask me, we can, I can tell you what the trick is a little bit later. OK, so let me get on now. I'm not going to show this, but if, I'm going to leave this to you as a tantalizing thing if you, in the question period, you want to see what this is. I'm not going to show it because it takes too much time right now. But what it is is the control room at Livingston. And uh, it takes one minute to do it and it's some explanation ahead of time. And if you want this, ask me in the, in the question period. I want to show you how we lock up the interferometer and all the signals that show up on these various monitors. I won't, I won't do it now. It's not essential. It's fun. OK, so now let's get on to the detection. Uh, there are con conditions that we have for what, what we say when we have made a detection. And there are very serious conditions. And uh, I think I try to list them as best as I can here. 
you have these two instruments, and if you have a detection, that means you have to see the same waveform in both the Livingston instrument as well as the Hanford instrument. So that's number one. And they have to be within 10 milliseconds of each other because we know what the velocity is of gravitational waves. We now know even better what it is. It's the velocity of light. And, so, and then on top of that, that's one of the most important conditions. The next condition is that we have a whole set of em environmental monitors in the, in, in the system that allow you to measure. If you see something in these environmental monitors separately at each site, if, for example, if you see there, there is too much ground noise, or the accelerator, there's too much noise on the chambers, or there's too much tilt, or there's too much acoustic noise, or the magnetic fields are too large, or there's too much RF interference, and God knows that, and so on and so on, all of these things have monitors. If you see a signal in those, when you see a signal that you think in the gravitational wave output, you veto it out. You don't use that signal. Okay? But that isn't the only, uh, that's, the only not, that's not the only protection you have. You will furthermore have something like 100,000 other channels that come out of the interferometric system that measure the alignment, that measure the power of the laser, the frequency noise of the laser, a whole bunch of variables. And if any of those look like they're out of hand, again, you would tend to be, that's a little trickier, but you still would veto the signals that you have. So here then is what we saw. And this is in that paper. All the next four pictures are all from the paper that was published. I, if you're interested in this, I beseech you to look at the paper. It's a beautiful paper. Not that beautiful paper in the following sense. People sweated over that paper to try to make it in English. It's a paper in English, not in scientific gobbledygook. Okay? <laughs> okay? And uh, so what, 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 what is here? What you see here is, this is somewhat tricky. You see the signal that we saw. First of all, here's the time scale is uh, down here. Uh, whoops. Yeah, it must be down here. Yeah, it's the same time scale for all of these. So this is not very long. It's 0.2 seconds from here to there. And here is the signal we actually saw in Hanford. Here is the, 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 the blue guy is the signal we see at Livingston. And now you've taken this signal, you've flipped it over because of the way the, the arms are arranged, and you've translated it by 7 milliseconds so they're on top of each other. And that's what you're seeing here. That's the raw signals. What's below this is signals that once you have solved for this and solved for the actual Einstein field equations and what these things are, you can post fit this later. But here is the best we were able to do. These are signals that come from two things that use the parameters you'll, you'll see in a minute, where we use numer numerical relativity, which is now the rage. In other words, we now can solve Einstein field equations. Not we, but people can solve Einstein's field equations on a computer, which was not possible 10 years ago. That's a Franz Pretorius made an enormous step forward there. And that's one of these. And then there are what are called uh, reconstructed signals, which are really analytic solutions. And the analytic solutions are a lot easier to run. You can men generate many of them. And so you want to do both. You want to have numerical solutions as well as analytic solutions that fit well. And so what you see here, then, is fits of both to the, uh, the, 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 the this is the, the, these are the, the, the wave signals that fit from the theory. And now why does it look so strange? And here I want to explain to you what you have. Well, well before I get to that, what, here's the residual. That's the difference between this and that. Okay? And the residual is small. And another thing that's worth noting here is, indeed, the biggest signal that you saw in this thing is about 10 to the minus 21 strain. Look at that. That's these things right there. So we just, we, were not, we weren't 100 miles off from what we needed. And what I, what I, it's not been explained by many people is something I want to explain to you. These signals, when you really look at them in terms of the theory, they don't look like that. These signals all, especially this one, has been filtered by the most simple-minded filter you can imagine. This is frequency, and this is the amplitude of the filter. It's the same thing you would do on, a, on an audio system. You have, a, ba you have a, base, a base, not boost, but attenuation, and you have a treble attenuation. And, that, and then you have, you have delta function notches where you have, for example, the violin modes of those suspensions and the 60 hertz line and some other modes in the, in the suspension. This signal, is the signal you're seeing here, is the true signal multiplied by the frequency response of this. And that causes this to attenuate. Because at low frequencies, you're, 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 this corner, all of this, is eating away at the signal. But we did that because, as you saw in the spectra, at low frequencies, the signal out of the instrument and the noise in the instrument is large. So this allows you something which is really quite spectacular, which we never expected. We never expected to see a signal like this by eye. I'll show you the other methods that we, this is, uh, this is you could look at the signal with that filter, and my god, you saw this thing. There was no fancy signal processing at all. It was big enough to do that, and that's very important. 
So here is another way to visualize that signal, and this is why it's called the chirp. But this is a sonogram of that same signal. As a, this is frequency going up. Here is middle C about. And this runs down in here. You can't see it because we cut it off. But this is this chirp that runs from about 30 hertz or a little, less than 30, a little more than 30 hertz up to about 200 in one of the instruments. And this is H1 uh, Hanford. And this is the Livingston. It's not quite as strong as the Livingston. And that, all of this together is uh, now interpreted as, as this. And here is the other picture in the paper. And it doesn't look like that because it, doesn't, it is not filtered by that same filter. OK? That's the important thing. And here is what the signal looks like for what will later turn out to be, as you'll see when we look at the pit, fitting, uh, two, two, approximately 230 solar mass black holes that are doing the following thing. They are in spiraling. They're quite far apart. They're almost in a Newtonian orbit. And that's why this is so sinusoidal and changing on the amplitude a little bit. And then they get closer, and the amplitude changes more dramatically. Eventually, they merge, and they form a new black hole somewhere in there. And then when the new black hole has formed, right after that, there is a relaxation which occurs because you haven't actually formed the new horizon exactly spherically, solidly symmetrically, or spherically symmetrically. It started someplace. And so waves run around the event horizon. And they die off at a certain frequency. And uh, they are, in fact, something we didn't see quite so well. But this is what the theory would give. And if you go back to the drawings, you'll see we did not get this part well. But we got all the rest of this exceedingly well. And so you'll see the fittings that have been done to this. And uh, by the way, so you get a little bit of the gee whiz out of this business. Here is, for example, two curves that are quite useful to, to imagine this, I mean, if you care to. And here is, a, this is the, 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 the relative velocity of these two guys is this green line. And there's a level, the relative velocity, but by the time they merge, and you can see that, is sort of sorting of half the velocity of light. I mean, here are 30 solar mass objects moving at close to half the velocity of light. Unbelievable. I mean, and, uh, and then here is the separation of them. And they're getting closer and closer. And that's what this is as a function of time. OK. Now I want to show you a little bit about the, the data processing. And we had the paper makes a fuss about this. And I'm glad it did. And that is that there are two ways that, and there are many ways to process the data. But for this thing, there is a method that is what we would call a generic method, which is the method that you would use when you're looking for something you, never, you don't know what it is. In other words, what's the thing that's common? You look for something that's common to the two detectors, but you don't urge it to be a chirp, or you don't urge it to be a black hole coalescence. You don't urge it to be anything. What is the correlation between those two detectors? And I'll show you how that works. You're looking now at two noisy signals. And what you're seeing here, by the way, so this curve you can see, is here's the event right there with a signal noise of about 20 in this method. And I'm not going to bother with this curve. But this is what you do if you, this green curve here is when you look at times when there's nothing coincident between the detectors, you still get a certain number of events per uh, number of events in a given sample. But here are the things when you are looking at coincidence. And it looks like everything is not there until you get to that. And so that is, you'll see in another presentation, that's very different. And let me see if I can get this, this, this thing to work. This may not be so trivial, given that this thing was giving trouble before. But what you're doing now is, you're, if you look at the bottom thing, you're sliding one detect, one detect the red guy against the blue guy. Those are Hanford Livingston. And you'll notice this is the product and the squaring of the product. And there's there, that's it. That's the coincidence signal between the two. And that's the co that is the way you would look for a, a totally unmodeled uh, system. And that we intend to continue to do that. Um, here, then, is the well, the more authorized way, or the, the once you know what you're looking for, you use every piece of information you have. And this is now a, a template search. And this is very much more complex in terms of the compute power that's needed. And what you're doing is you're, used, you're doing the same thing. We'll get to that in a second. Here is the curves for it. For example, now what you do is you slide a template. And you have many, many templates with different masses, different spins. I mean, there are something like 200,000 templates. I think that's right. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. But, uh, and, but they all have different numbers of parameters. The parameters are 16, 15 parameters, but they are not the same parameters always. And so this is a huge computational task. And, it, and uh, you, you, now people begin to use parallel processors so that they can use, keep this up timely in a timely way. And now what you get a very different behavior of this thing. Here what happens when you do this, and then you'll see why it's different, is because you're not multiplying the noise in the instrument against the noise in the instrument. You're looking at a clean template against a noisy instrument. So let me just show you what that looks like. That's a little different. 
Um, and uh, let's see if this can be made to work. Yeah, again, the same thing. You'll see that the template, there's a template. Here's the product at, at squared. And now you'll see that it's a very clean, big signal that comes out when this happens. It's because you're, you're now using a now noise-free template against the, uh, against the signal. And you can calculate from that a rate. And I, the way that's done, by the way, is that's done by breaking all the data we have into the correlation that that template has is of, is of the order of a tenth of a second, or maybe two tenths of a second. And what you can do is you can think of all the run that was made, which is about 16 days for this particular thing, and think of every other 0.2 second interval as an independent experiment. And that's what's done. And you let then use those as a way of getting the event rate that is coming from just noise in the instrument. And that turns out, when you do this little calculation, here's that correlation time, 0.2. And tau is the total time of looking. You will get a rate. And that rate is something like 1 over 200,000 years. So this event, this one event, is really not something you can expect the instrument to do too often. And here it is. There it is. But there's something interesting right here. Look at that. That is possibly another event. If that had been the only event, we would have fought for hours and days <laughs> deciding on whether we want to publish that. But uh, that most likely is also, it has a, uh, it has a, I don't know exactly what its false alarm rate is, but it's being analyzed. And uh, there are more events possibly in, this, in the next run, in the part of the run that hasn't been looked at yet. So here are some of the results that come out by param parameter estimation of this particular waveform. And, and uh, this is done by Monte Carlo techniques. For, you know, uh, and uh, it's just using, using Bayesian, statistics, Bayesian methods with Monte Carlo techniques, which allows you to run the models over and over again over the same data. And for example, here is the uh, probability distribution for the mass of one of them, sort of 35 it peaks at. And then here is the other, the other black hole. It sort of peaks at about 30. And that's the contours for that. Here, for example, is the spin. We, by the way, we don't know the spin of the, of the initial. We can't get the spins very easily of the initial black holes. That's because it seems to be that, as we'll see this in a second, that seems to be that there is not much precession. That's due to the, the thing is being, we look at it face on. In other words, here's the apparatus, and the, the, the black holes are, are, are in, in, a, in, a, in a, an orbit like that, and it's not like this. You can get some information from that. Anyway, so uh, what, what, what it was, what, what's shown here is the net spin of the, the final black hole and its total mass. And when you look at this and that, you find out that it's a pretty good probability that three solar masses have been lost into gravitational waves from the, by, by this collision, which is remarkable in a huge amount. And then there is plots, for example, the thing that gave us the distance is once you know the theory, once you know relativity works, and these are, can be explained by relativity, you, do, you know how big the, stra the strains are, you can then calculate the strain you have, compare it to the one that you estimate, and you now know the thing is about 400 megaparsecs or 1.3 billion light years away. So that should be billion, not, yeah. OK, mega, OK. Um, so uh, and then here is something which is the thing that is the fact that because we can't do very well, this is a map. Here's a south celestial pole right there. And this is the error bar that we have. And this is as well as we can do right now, but it's a pretty good feat to have done this, where the source might be. And the people are looking and have looked in that region for other things, you know, the electromagnetic people. OK, let me go on. Um, the, uh, the, the black holes aren't the only thing we're, we're going to be looking for. We now know something, that there are black holes. And that's important. But on the other hand, there are many more things in nature that could make gravitational waves. And we're going to be looking for all of them. This was always what we wanted to do. Clearly, black holes and neutron stars, these compact binaries, which have template switches. But we will also be looking for supernova. Now, unfortunately, supernova have gone through a complicated history. In the early days, 1% we estimated might go into gravitational waves. And now it's maybe as small as 10 to the minus 5. It's tiny. And the models don't make it look very good. So probably we are stuck with looking at supernova in our own galaxy or maybe our neighboring galaxies. But it'd be spectacular, absolutely spectacular, if we caught one of those. That would be a, a, a complete new view of what goes on in supernova. You would look deep into the inside of the supernova, find out what really is going on in the dynamics. You can't see that from electromagnetic things at all. Neutrinos don't, don't even give you that. So we get the actual motion of the things that are inside the explosion. And, uh, that's, what we'll, and that's a big thing to look for one of these days. I hope we manage to see this. And then uh, types of sources, that's one of the things. We don't know everything out there. In fact, that's going to be one of the big challenges. 
Now, people looking for triggered searches, for example, people now think that gamma ray bursts may very well be short gamma ray bursts, might be neutron pairs of neutron stars. That's something we've been doing. We'll continue doing that, looking in coincidence with gamma ray bursts uh, and seeing if we see something in the instrument. There are people looking for continuous wave sources. For example, a pulsar, and this is the earliest ideas that people had. You have a pulsar, which has a magnetic field. It's spinning here, and it has a magnetic field like that, so it wobbles because it's a compression of the neutron star by the magnetic field. That is a radiation source that will be a continuous CW source. Be wonderful for a lot of studies you would like to do. We'd learn a lot about what's going on in magnetic fields of neutron stars, what they really they have. And by the way, something that's a big thing is if we ever see a neutron star, neutron star collision, like here, we could tell a lot what happens when they actually collide as they get close together and they, mer they, they merge just before they become black holes. You should be able to see what the stiffness is of the equation of state of the nuclear matter. That's the thing that's hold held out as a very important thing to do for nuclear physics. So, Anyway, I, I, then their stochastic background which is the, the, most, the most likely one we will see with LIGO is something that has to do with unresolved foreground sources. For example, we could probably start seeing in, near the end of these runs uh, with this new instrument an a, a unresolved noise of black holes that are all over the universe and see it as, a, as an isotropic background. I don't think we have a chance with this instrument in fact, I know we don't have a chance, unless something very strange goes on in, in nature, to be able to look at the primeval, primordial gravitational waves that come from the quantum fluctuations of inflation. That's not something that's in the cards for us. And so um, what I, what I want to say, the last few slides I have, I want to show you the, 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 the future. Here, then, is where we are, this green curve. And if we then, this is the theoretical curve, this one, for advanced LIGO, if you put the, all the power into it, we haven't done that yet. Here's the curve for advanced Virgo right there, and they nicely coincide at that point. And this will be the wave of the future. This will be the detections of the future, not so distant, I hope, within the next few years. OK. However, and, then, and we'll have better definition. And by the way, as let me say something important about this. Every time you improve the detector by a factor of two, let's say its sensitivity by two, you improve the amount of volume of the universe that you're looking at by a factor of two to the cube. So consequently, the rates, if they are sort of one per month at the moment, if we, have, in fact, make it a factor of two, just a factor of two improvement in the next few months even, or the next few, let's say, next six months, and we get it, we will get an event per day. Imagine that. And that's of this kind, the ones we know about. Okay? So this thing is the whole field has changed because of the fact that we now know something. Okay? We didn't know anything beforehand. And uh, so uh, now, the, then there are ideas for making it so that, and there are ideas here in Europe and in the United States, and these are very future ideas. First of all, how to improve LIGO itself with cryogenics and with squeezing light and a lot of tricks we might be able in the four kilometer systems to get down to here. That's another factor of three. That's probably five, six years off. Hope it's only as little as that. And then way into the future, people are thinking about how would you take this whole field and propagate it into cosmology. In other words, how could you actually get a detector that could make an assay of these compact sources all the way to the limits of the beginning of the universe? Not, I mean, the beginnings of star formation. And yes, you can. It's a new, a new way. It's a more ex big, expensive new project, but has to be thought about. OK, so let me sort of finish with two things. This is now, we're not the only people. LIGO is not the only people who are doing gravitational wave research. And in fact, this is sort of a spectrum of the whole gravitational wave spectrum. What you see, this is now frequency. Here is 10 to, 10 to the 4 hertz. That's LIGO. But here are the strains that are associated with that, H. And here, this is LIGO and the things it will look for, all these compact binary things I've talked about. There's a project called LISA, which is going to look at periods of hours to minute. And that's a space program which has been in that, almost in planning as long as LIGO has. As I told you about that earlier. Uh, and that is now has, has, a, has a pathfinder that's working. And it was a NASA ESA project. NASA gave it up. And we're trying very hard for e NASA to come back into it. It will make it a better project, a far better project. And uh, uh, then, um, then there is a technique which is called this pulsar timing. I pointed that in my history. And that is using pulsars, millisecond pulsars that are all over the universe and using, or all over our galaxy, 
looking at radiation coming in from the universe. And what you do is you look at the timing. If they're good timers, if they're good clocks, you will see slight changes in the timing. And depending on where you're looking at the different millisecond pulsars, you can then divine the shape of the gravitational wave source, of the gravitational wave itself in our own galaxy. So that looks for very big black holes colliding with each other. And it might look for an isotropic background of gravitational waves from unresolved sources. And finally, this thing which made the big stir, this is BICEP and the polarization of the BICEP was the experiment everybody heard about. I'm going to tell you again, BICEP is a first class experiment. I'm serious about that. It's a good experiment. And people are like that, are doing experiments like that all over. They're going to succeed eventually, I hope. And the only trouble they ran into is they had only one frequency. They had, they had to worry about dust. And they didn't measure the dust independently. So that's the very lowest frequency of all. And that would be a spectacular source to see. OK. And so here is a summary of, the, of my talk, at least for that part that has to do with results. We have a direct detection. That's very important. That opens a new field of astronomy. In other words, we're not doing the same thing. We have an instrument that now can look at the universe in gravitational waves. The profundity of that is that it really does open a new field of astronomy. How good that astronomy field is, we don't know yet. But we already know a couple of things that are in it. Uh, we have a thing which I think, to me, is the most remarkable of all. We have consistency of the Einstein field equations, the thing that Einstein killed himself over in, no in November of 1915. And the consistency is good over a dynamic range from uh, Cavendish experiments to black holes. It's not, we haven't proved it to the night at last iota, but it's consistent. And to the, what we know right now, the information we have, the theory, the, gra the, gravi the, the Einstein field equations work over this huge dynamic range of gravitational fields. It's a, a triumph, I have to tell you that. To me, it's a, it was all done in one guy's head. It's amazing. And that should it's absolutely amazing. And, uh, and now we know two things about astronomy we didn't know before. The universe contains binary black holes that collide. That's something we couldn't have known before. We didn't even plan on that. Okay? And there are more black holes than we thought. Okay. So here are the people who have, and I quickly at the end, <laughs> that is the collaboration. I don't dare that you go, there are 90, 90 institutions on that picture with 1,000 people in it. Okay, But that's the LIGO scientific collaboration. And then for the laboratory itself, this is the group at Caltech. I don't want to point out everybody to you. You might have to maybe you'll find your friends in there. But uh, that's the group at Caltech. I can't spend enough time pointing out everybody. Here is the group at MIT. And uh, you'll probably recognize several people in there, too. Some hanging around in the, like, who weren't there for the picture. <laughs> And, uh, and then here is the group at, at the, Li the LIGO Livingston site, all, all employees of this, of, this, of this huge project. And, uh, and then finally, here is the group at uh, the LIGO Hanford Observatory. So thank you very much. That's it. That's it. <laughs> By the way, you're clapping for a lot of people. There are many of them distributed. LIGO people who you see in this picture are distributed through a hall. I hope you congratulate them, too. And, OK. So I, have you got, who's going to be the master? You're going to be? Yeah. Okay. Congratulations okay. to you, yeah. you and your <laughs> bunch again. So uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, probably not all, everybody, but. Can the LIGO people stand up? That's a good idea. Why That's a good idea. Yeah, everybody who works on LIGO, get up. Thank you, Bernie. That was good. OK. <laughs> Question. Yes? So at low frequencies, you're limited by size and noise. Is the limitation due to like, how far you, like, the range of actuators, or is it how sensitively you detect low frequency noise? OK. You, if I understand you right, you're asking what, in the end, limits us due to the seismic noise. Is that the question? Yeah, what, why can't you feed back? 
Yeah, well, you can. And, and, but the real problem is, in the end, pretty much what I told you. There are two problems. One is fundamental, and the other one is not. Uh, one problem is the gravity gradients that come with the seismic noise, and the fact that there are density waves in both the atmosphere and in the ground, which actually pull on the mass. It's, there's not an acceleration of the support of the, of the suspension anymore. It's actually a force on the mass. That's hard to deal with. You can try, and people thinking about putting arrays of seismometers out and arrays of barometers out to try to map that. It turns out it's not trivial. Okay? Uh, but it's, it, it, will, it certainly will be done, because it gets, maybe it gets you a factor of two or three or something like that. Uh, the, the, the real problem is that the, that gravity gradient problem is, well, I've answered that. The other problem is well, that's much more, less, less fundamental. Our instruments at this moment don't separate well a tilt of the ground from a horizontal acceleration. That happens to be just because horizontal seismometers measure both together. That's what, and so there are ways to separate that, and I think we're making devices that will do that. That may improve our performance. Okay. Yes. How much improvement could you expect to get with an instrument in space? Well, the improvement is a, it's more not that there would be sensitivity improvement. What you get is an improvement in the range of frequencies that you can look at. In other words, the, we're limited on the ground to probably, and people here will argue that. Some people will say it's 20 hertz, and I'll say maybe 10 hertz. But it just gets very sharp. It goes up like a, a rocket, you know, the noise at 10 hertz. And if you want to see gravitational waves of a completely different character from gigantic black holes, and other, for example, binary stars in our own galaxy, ordinary binary stars that Einstein might have looked at you know, as one of his first attempts when he tried to look at where might he see gravitational waves from. You have periods of hours on, in many of the very strong binary star systems, white dwarf systems. And so those things are going to be done by LISA. And then even heavier, bigger map black, black holes will be done by the, by, by the, uh, the, the um, pulsar timing. And then finally, the universe, as I point out to you, is that the fluctuations in the quantum fluctuations of the very first moments of the, of the universe may very well have generated gravitational waves. And that will be seen, could be seen certainly by the, we hope, by the polarization of the cosmic background. And also, there are ideas, but they're far more fancy than the LISA, to try to do this in space from an interferometer in space. Okay? Yes. I can't understand. Where are you? Yeah. Uh, you said that the, the amplitude of the wave is 1 over 10,000 of the diameter of a proton. No, I said the strain is. OK, be careful. That's a, let me try to tell you. The, the gravitational wave carries a strain, which is a ratio of a displacement. OK. Well, that's what it is. I mean, we're taking the why we can do this is we're not measuring individual protons. I mean, here you've got this mirror, which has you know, got 40 kilograms of matter in it. And we're averaging over all the molecules and all the molecules in it. So we're averaging over 10 to the 24 atoms. That's why we can do this. OK? We're not looking at individual motions. Of, I think I, I still don't know if I really answered your question. Yeah, the, the quantum vibrations, is one that, that is more than that. Well, wait a minute. Okay, you're talking about the, the, the normal mode motions of the mirror itself. We measure those, and we see them. And what we do is we, intend, what we design the mirrors so they're not little thin little things. You know, they're not little thin little things, so they have very low frequencies. We design them. This is a big chunk of glass. It's about that big and just about that thick. Okay. And that, if you look at the normal modes of that, most of the normal modes in the, of the mirror fall outside of our observation region. They fall, they fall at 10 kilohertz and higher frequencies. They are there, though, and they're thermally driven. Yeah. Yes, up in back. Yeah, no, you in the white uh, jumper. Yeah. Is there a big time difference between the time of detection and the time of the discovery of the way? Or is the amount of data that's being collected Without being processed, just growing. OK. Now, you ask a hard question. Let me see if I, if I, let me try to repeat it. You're saying, why did it take us so long? Uh, <laughs> and uh, here's this thing that happened on September 14th in the 
paper came out publicly uh, on the 11th of February. What intervened between that? Well, let me tell you, first of all, a lot of time went into trying to deal with the bad history in this field. And I'm going to say this in, a, in a, probably the, a, not a nasty way. Weber didn't make it easy for us. Okay? In other words, that was one. And BICEP, because of its premature and announcement, although it's, as I said, a gorgeous experiment, didn't make it easy either. So we felt, as a collaboration, that we had to be right. And that takes a while. You go through all the checks. You go through, I mean, checking everything, checking that there was no other signals, checking that nobody interfered with the computers. I, mean, I won't go into the litany of this. It takes a while to do that. Then, it takes, with 1,000 people, it takes a while to write a paper. <laughs> Krishna. So, uh, following, I have two questions. One is to follow up from September 14th until you first saw that waveform on a monitor. How long did that take? Just to follow up the previous question. Uh, me personally? Well, everybody has a different story. I mean, uh, Matt saw it right away, OK? Uh, I saw it because I was on vacation and, uh, in Maine, and I couldn't keep a secret. I mean, my, I looked at the thing, and I said, holy mackerel. And, uh, and, and my son was sitting in a, in a table. And my wife was sitting there. I said, what's so good? And they had to come over. And I, keeping a secret was hopeless. And uh, so, so in my case, it was, I, I think I got, a, I got an email both from Mike Zucker and from David Shoemaker telling me there was something unusual going on. Not, yeah. The question I actually wanted to ask was, on your last slide for the, your summary, the last point was there are more black holes than we thought. Could you say a little more about that? Yeah, I can say. I mean, there, it's a little tricky to answer you, because I, either through the leaks that have been, there are more papers than you can imagine now, all of a sudden, on making black holes. But let me tell you what existed, let's say, more, not more than four months ago. How do you get black holes of that size? We, uh, first of all, I mean, we knew about black holes from, everybody knew about black holes because of the X-ray experiments that were done here at MIT and, and at the Naval Research Lab. And I remember many discussions with Phil Morrison, who didn't believe in them, and, and we, about why it was cheaper to make that hypothesis that there were black holes. But never mind, that's a story. Uh, I had to say that. Uh, <laughs> but the. Uh, but the, the thing is that we knew about black holes that were of the order of some number of solar masses that you saw from X-ray astronomy. We knew of black holes that live in our, in our, that are eating away in our galaxy and other galaxies. That's fairly recent, but it's known. But what wasn't known is that there were black holes in the estimate of about between hundreds to thirties of solar masses. That was the first thing. And we could not, the thing we could not do at the time, especially for ourselves, make a prediction, what would be the rate that we would detect these at? Because nobody knew the number. Nobody really knew the number. What we did know a little bit was the number of neutron stars, because there are a few examples of neutron star binaries in our own galaxy, and you know how many of those there are. And you can then, through various tricks of population synthesis, get an idea how many of those there would be. But there was no way that we had to gauge the number of black hole pairs. Now, what, how do you make black holes? And that's good. I bet you there are going to be many papers about this. Uh, but the way that I knew about it and most people knew about it, there are two, me two methods that people knew that made of this size. One of them was to hypothesize that there were population three stars. And what they are are stars that come very close to after the, the first cooling down of the plasma, of the, well, a Z of six or 10, when you begin to make the first stars out of hydrogen. And those, uh, there's no way to eliminate, no, there's no way to cool them down because there are no lines in the infrared. Hydrogen is all UV, and the piddling amounts of de, uh, de deuterium. Yeah, there's a little bit of there are rotational lines, that you could use those. In fact, those are the things that eventually cool these stars very, very slowly. And so you get star Because of that, you get stars that are quite fat, enormous stars, and uh, hundreds of solar masses, probably. And I think we will learn much more about this from uh, James Webb and others, uh, and from the work that Jackie Hewitt is hopefully is doing, you know, to look at the, the tomography of the universe at that time. So that's one method. As those things collapse, you might get big solar, uh, hundreds of solar mass, or 30 solar mass black holes. The other way, which was not so popular at that time, was to use uh, 
a dynamical process that occurs in globular clusters, which are in every, in every galaxy we see them. There are things that are shining very brightly. They have 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 stars in them. And there are very ch reasonable chances that you can have three body collisions there. And the three body collisions then enable momentum and angular momentum and momentum conservation and energy conservation more easily. And so you can make black holes. And that's the other method. And people talk about how you distinguish these methods, for example. And one of the things is if we ever measure the spins, for example, we, of the progenitor black holes, we will find out if there was a common envelope kind, like from a supernova or where a big star collapsed, we will find out generally it's the same thing as in our solar system. Everything's spinning the same way, right-handed. So the spins will be that way. The orbital parts will be that way. So you would expect the spins of the black holes to be mostly aligned with the orbit. With the orbit. But that's not the case in globular, in globular clusters where you're coming in at all angles and stuff. So look, this is a field that's now going to open up like crazy. You'll see. I bet you 10 papers a week. <laughs> I, I think there have been 10 papers during this colloquium. One, <laughs> one more question. Yes. <laughs> OK, I will do that. But I want people who want to leave to leave. I mean, well, what I'm gonna sh that's the part that has to do with the one minute. It takes probably you're going to be here for another three or four minutes. OK, uh, I'm let's, glad to do uh, let's do that. But let's first thank Ray again. <laughs> If you need to leave, please. It's okay. Yeah, it's, Ray says it's okay. No more than okay. Uh, it's then, better, then it's better than okay because this is slow. <laughs> My God, you all want to see how this thing works. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I think. Can you lower the lights? Is that possible? Because here the the visibility has to be good enough so you can see the screen. Okay. Let me describe what you have here. Good, thank you. Uh, what you see is a mock-up of the, whoops. Look, and if this bores you, walk out on it. I'd be, please don't, uh, please don't, don't be forced to be here. But what do you have, a, here's a model of the interferometer. And so you see these arrows, or, and this, these are screens. And for example, what you'll see here is on that screen, you'll see the scattered light from the front surface of that mirror. There's a camera looking at it. That'll be there. And corresponding, there'll be a scattered, there'll be a camera looking at the scattered light from this mirror. That's, that'll be there. And this is the this is the uh, y arm, and here is the x arm. The same thing. Here is a again uh, scattered light from the front of that, scattered light from the input mirror, and then there are there is a there is a uh, way of getting light that's being returned back to the laser. That'll be here, and then there's light at the anti-symmetric port which is the place where you get the gravitational wave signal. That'll be there. Now, there's too much to see here. But I'll point out a few things that the place to keep your eye, I think the important thing is to watch when you begin to load up the cavities with light. You'll see that here in, the, in these two things, and you'll see that there. We now have a way of actually dialing in the length of these cavities very carefully so they resonate at the light that comes out of the laser. And you'll see that happen. And it's done in two ways. And the two ways are due to the fact that if you look at this middle curve right here, this is the one that's all, all important. All the operators are always looking at this. And what this is, is you, this is the no, you see this is that same curve I was showing you in terms of frequency going this way and the spectral density of H this way. And this is one of the, this is a noise curve that was taken as an average noise curve that was taken when the instrument was locked and running well. And now you see it before this all starts way up there. So the noise out of this instrument is pretty awful at this moment. This is orders of magnitude. You can see that. And then there are other things which are just too many things to see. Here's the ground noise. That won't change much. Here is the range. That won't change much. So I think I've pointed out all the things to you. And now what you're going to see, you're going to see a lock that takes about 20 minutes. People operating, operators with scripts, doing a whole, all sets of adjustments to bring the instrument into alignment and into the proper lengths. And what you'll see is this whole thing's been compressed to about a, a minute. The real clock time is right there. And, the, uh, and also the seconds, this is, this can go like a whiz, this right here. So I'm going to start it. And I'll try to point things out to you as, as we go along. Um, 
OK, it's going to start now. Good. Um, you can see the anti-symmetric port uh, where the light, and there's the symmetric port. There, the people are getting things ready. By the way, this is the mode cleaner. That's not going to change much. Here are the signals that come out of the laser. They're not going to change much. And what you'll first see, that's interesting thing, is when the light starts up in these two places, you'll also see this showing you the amount of light that's in the cavities. It's starting to grow. You see this? And now you see the light. Whoop, there's light now on the two mirrors. Two, and now what they're doing is they're doing something called RF locking the system. The noise has come down a little already. But what happens is that's not the lowest noise. What we use is we use a DC lock, which means we don't modulate anymore. We bring the system into its, into its state where we want to have it by using radio frequency modulation. But now what's happened is we're now, well, I will talk too much. It's already in the DC lock. And you'll notice that as they tune the system, you'll notice the noise eventually gets down to the point where it's equal to the noise of the reference spectrum. It's not there yet. Yeah, and they're, what they're doing is they're turning on different alignment systems. And there's a little bit of extra noise left right here, which isn't in the spectrum, but you're pretty much there. And uh, well, now the, the thing will probably stop. OK. Anyway, I could play it again, but I don't think you, won't, you won't learn much more. It's just the excitement of that is just spectacular at the site when you look at this thing all together coming together. And this used to, this used to be explosive in the initial detector. Uh, Matt Evans wrote a pe program with the Nergis together to, uh, that was tried, we do it in a much tamer way. We actually can dial in the two cavities nowadays. But in the earlier days, it was much more explosive and interesting. What they did is they tried to catch a swinging mirror and catch it and to give it enough momentum just so it would lock. And that was always very, very exciting. But not that, <laughs> that excitement has gone away. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah.